Hey guys, welcome again to FDT Christian Lifestyle Channel. Uh, this is where we talk and discuss about anything Christian related. So if you're interested in that, then this is your home. Welcome on board. Now, I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've heard of that, that there are three people in the Bible that really never died. And uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about today. So uh, today we're talking about a very interesting topic. So uh, welcome you all. And just say like, at the end, do not forget to give us your comments uh, on the subscription and also subscribe to the channel. I also would, would really, really mind uh, having you, uh, you liking our videos. It will really help us with the YouTube algorithm. And also don't forget again, once again, to subscribe to the channel. Well, in the Bible, three men never died. And the names are simply Enoch, Elijah, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek. The story of Enoch is found in the book of Genesis. And Enoch was a descendant of Adam, as we full well know. Uh, lived uh, during a time when people were walking in great wicked nation. However, Enoch walked faithfully with God and had a close relationship with him. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. That is found in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Enoch was taken by God by passing death and was translated into the presence of God. Now the story uh, of Elijah, the second gentleman, is recorded in the books of uh, the book of Kings. And Elijah was a prophet who lived during a time of spiritual apostasy in Israel. He performed numerous miracles and confronted the idolatrous practices of the people then. Eventually, as the time came for Elijah to depart from this world, he was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind accompanied by a chariot of fire. And remember, Elijah's disciple Elisha witnessed this remarkable event. And it will later be the reason why he will receive the double portion. Mechizedek, the third gentleman, is, is mentioned in the Bible, of, in the book of Genesis, and later referred to in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. And he's described as both a king and a priest who blessed Abraham after his victory in battle. Now, the Bible states that Melchizedek had no genealogy, he had no beginning, no had no end and he is described as being a priest forever and uh, um, if, if, if uh, this enigmatic figure uh, which is Melchizedek is seen as a type of uh, foreshadowing of Christ and Melchizedek is deemed as a high priest forever these three individuals Enoch, Elijah and Melchizedek stand out even by not facing flesh death actually in the bubble they never faced death and it's quite interesting that Enoch God just took him away Elijah was also taken by shadow of fire and there's no record whatsoever in the scripture wherever that Melchizedek passed on or he died now let's just take a deeper look into this whole thing and get a look at them up close and candid one by one so we start with the gentleman uh, Enoch all right um enoch walked with god as we have read now our journey into uh, biblical immortality begins with enoch now enoch a man after god's own heart enoch a man whose life um was distinguished by his unwavering walk with god and in genesis 5 from verse 22 to 24 it's written that Enoch walked faithfully with God for 300 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him. Let's unpack the profound meaning behind Enoch's extraordinary journey. Now, Enoch's religious work, obviously, Enoch's life was characterized by rare and consistent faithfulness, and his work with God wasn't just a physical journey but a spiritual one that was marked by righteousness and obedience. The mysterious disappearance of Enoch. Now, the scriptures tell us that Enoch was no more because God took him. This mysterious phrasing hints at a unique fate, an extraordinary departure that sets Enoch apart from the ordinary cause of life, 
and death. Now the implications of Enoch's story are Enoch's story prompts reflection on the intimacy possible between humans and God. His challenge, his life challenges uh, all of us to seek a profound connection with God, transcending the limitations of earthly existence. That no matter what, I'm going to serve Him, I'm going to love God, I'm going to get deeper and grow day by day into a deeper relationship and connection with Him. Now, in ancient scriptures, a profound testimony resonates concerning a man that is named Enoch, a seventh generation descendant of Adam and the father of Methuselah, who is the longest lived individual in Bible history. Now, in the book of Genesis, the age of sin and evil, uh, um, in the midst of a world steeped in sin and evil, Enoch still emerges as a beacon of righteousness. Genesis unfolds the bleak panorama of humanity's fall, the consequences of sin, and the heart-wrenching account of Cain and Abel's uh, fratricide. Against this backdrop of increasing wickedness, Enoch's life stands out as a testament to his unwavering commitment to walking with God. Now, Enoch's consistent walk with God in Genesis 5, 22 to 24, he paints a very clear, vivid picture of Enoch's life. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah for 300 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In a world where every imagination of the human heart was continuously evil, Enoch demonstrated a remarkable consistency in his walk with God. He pleased God and maintain the steadfast fellowship with him. Faithful Enoch in Hebrews uh, and in the book of Job, uh, actually in Hebrews it's in 11, 5 to 6, Father amplifies Enoch's legacy of faith. He says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. But without faith it is impossible to please God. Now Enoch's translation to heaven without experiencing death underscores the extraordinary faith that pleased God. A testimony of diligent seeking that it can be summarized by Enoch's life. Now Enoch's life challenges all of us believers to emulate his diligence in seeking and walking with God. In an ungodly era, he demonstrated that faith transcends the external circumstances of the world. The testimony of Enoch echoes through the ages, reminding us that even in the most challenging times, walking with God is both a privilege and a pursuit. Enoch's divine transition, obviously Enoch's departure from this earthly realm was exceptional. And we've read about it in Genesis 5.24 and Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. They all emphasize that he was not, for God took him. And like those who succumbed to the fear of death, Enoch experienced a direct translation into heaven. This unique privilege was granted to a man who pleased God with his consistent walk of faith. Enoch's story transcends mortality, illustrating that fellowship with God doesn't cease with earthly life. As believers, we are encouraged to look forward to the continuation of this divine life and communication even in the next life. The scriptural narrative implies that Enoch's work with God extends beyond the earthly realm, a truth that resonates with every believer today. Now, Enoch's legacy serves as a compelling reminder that in our work with God, there's a profound privilege awaiting us, a privilege not only in this life, but one that extends into eternity. Number two is the gentleman Elijah. Now, Elijah, a name resonating with the affirmation that Yahweh is my God, or the Lord is my God, emerges in the sacred scriptures as a prophet of unparalleled distinction. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah's introduction as a Tishbite sets the stage for his extraordinary mission. This mission unfolded during a tumultuous period in Israel's history when idolatry had gripped the nation. Ahab, the king of Israel, had forged an alliance with Sidon 
through marriage to Princess Jezebel, further entrenching the worship of Baal. Now Elijah's divine assignment was clear to turn the hearts of the Israelites back to their true God. Elijah's confrontation of Mount Carmel, very, very uh, common and famous um, extract in the scriptures. In King, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21 to 22, Elijah, in a bold declaration, challenged the wavering Israelites. He said, How long hal ye hal chi between two opinions? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Ba, then follow him. So this challenge set the stage for the iconic showdown among Kamo. Elijah standing alone against 450 prophets of Baal orchestrated a test to reveal the true God. Now, the God that answered it by fire, let him be God. 1 Kings 18, 24. Now the result was a divine spectacle when the fire of the Lord God consuming came from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, the dust, and even licked up the water in the trench. <laughs> As the people witnessed this miraculous display, they fell on their faces, proclaiming that indeed the Lord, He is God. That is in 1 Kings 18 verse 39. Now Elijah, unwavering in his dedication to God, instructed the people to seize the prophets of Baal. In a dramatic turn, Elijah led them to the brook of Kishon and executed judgment upon them. This decisive act solidified Elijah's role as a messenger of divine justice. Now, Elijah's prophetic ministry extended beyond Mount Carmel. In 1 Kings 17, he declared a drought, bringing about three and a half years of no rain. He was miraculously sustained by ravens during this period. Elijah also displayed God's power by raising the dead, releasing rain to end the drought and pronouncing judgment upon Jezebel. Now, humanity in the midst of miracles, uh, in, in the book of James chapter 5 verse 17, he basically seeks to affirm um, uh, Elijah's humanity, stating, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that you do not rain. Despite his extraordinary feats, Elijah described as having a nature, a nature like ours, experienced moments of boldness and fear, showcasing the accessibility of God's power to an ordinary man. Now in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, we witness Elijah's departure from earth in a chariot of fire and horses of fire, escorted by a whirlwind into heaven. And like most mortals, Elijah did not experience death. Instead, he entered glory in a spectacular chariot of fire. Elijah's life stands as a testament to the extraordinary works God accomplishes throughout ordinary individuals and throughout the ages. His legacy transcends the miraculous, the miraculous events he orchestrated, reminding us that God answers the prayers of normal and ordinary people. The chariots of fire symbolize Elijah's unique entry into heavenly realms, avoiding the grasp of death and leaving us with a profound image of divine majesty. Now, the final gentleman is Melchizedek, and the, ministry, the mystery of Melchizedek will be solved here. Now, um, it's believed that he's without genealogy and he's also the end of days. Now, let's unravel the, ministry, the mystery surrounding Melchizedek, a figure introduced in Genesis and later expounded upon in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. It's intriguingly stated, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now, the enigmatic figure of Melchizedek has intrigued scholars and believers alike you know, for many centuries right now. However, a close examination and exegesis of both the Old and the New Testament sheds more light on the identity of this mysterious individual. Now, Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God. Genesis 14. During a time of conflict in Canaan and Mesopotamia, Abraham's nephew Lord was captured. Abraham, armed with his servants, he rescued Lord and his family. On his return, a mysterious figure named Melchizedek, the king of Salem or Jerusalem and priest of the Most High God appeared. So what happens? Melchizedek blessed Abraham and Abraham, recognizing his divine authority, 
gave him a tithe of all. Now, the meaning behind the name. Now, the name Mekizedek, first of all, carries a significant meaning. It is derived from Hebrew, where Melki means my king and Zedek means righteousness. Thus, Melchizedek is interpreted as king of righteousness. Additionally, he is called the king of Salem, meaning the king of peace, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2. Now, these titles, when applied to anyone other than God, will be blasphemous, emphasizing the divine nature of Melchizedek. Now, the incomparable attributes. The book of Hebrews provides further insights into Melchizedek's unique attributes. He is described as having no recorded genealogy, no beginning of days, and no end of days, Hebrews 7.3. These characteristics set him apart as a divine being existing eternally without a human lineage. Now, the identification in Hebrews Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1 to 3 is again solidifies the identity of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, here Melchizedek is explicitly identified as the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Not God the Father, but a manifestation, all right? Now, while Melchizedek possesses divine attributes, he cannot be God the Father. He was a priest of the Most High God, and scripture asserts that no one has seen the Father. Instead, Melchizedek is described as being made like unto the Son of God, signifying a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ the eternal high priesthood. Now, furthermore, Melchizedek's perpetual priesthood is emphasized. Even in Paul's time, after Christ's ascension, Melchizedek abides a priest continually. Hebrews 7.3 states that categorically. Now, this underscores that Melchizedek and Christ are one and the same, with both holding the eternal office of the high priest. The unity of Melchizedek and Christ. Now hear this. In conclusion, furthermore, Melchizedek's identity becomes clear throughout the lens of Scripture. Melchizedek and Christ are inseparable, representing the eternal King of Righteousness and the King of Peace, the divine and perpetual High Priest who guides humanity to salvation. Now the the mystery surrounding Melchizedek and Ravens, revealing a profound connection to the redemptive plan orchestrated by God. All right, here's our conclusion and reflection. Son in the three gentlemen that never died. Talked about Enoch, talked about Elijah, and Melchizedek. Now, here's a conclusion and something to reflect about. In conclusion here, the stories of Enoch, Elijah, and Melchizedek offer us a glimpse into the mysterious ways God interacts with humanity. These narratives invite us to reflect on faith, righteousness, and the eternal nature of God's plan. Now, um, I want to encourage you, okay, uh, my viewers and my listeners, to just delve deeper into the stories of these three uh, gentlemen as you have checked them out. I give you some verses to just for your reference to just check them out and be able to understand further. Now. I wish to start from there today, um, um, but, but, but perhaps you've got your own uh, thoughts into uh, this topic of today, the three men that never died. I uh, would love to hear your comment, comment uh, your, your reaction towards this sim. Perhaps you've got some other thoughts that could really help us, or a direction that you want us to pursue. As, as far as our next video is concerned now don't you forget don't you forget to subscribe to this channel if you are yet to do that I was checking the, the the algorithm here and the statistics is clearly true that most of you haven't subscribed yet so and again i want to ask you hum- humbly and kindly to just give leave a like just like our video it really help us a big deal all right so thank you so much guys and um I want to end with this question. Would you, have you ever thought that perhaps what happened to Elijah 
And what happened to Enoch? God translating them and taking them to heaven. That they will not die. Could happen again. Just think about that for a moment. The Bible says Elijah was a man of like passions just like us. He will fear sometimes. He will be strong. He will be at his best. He will be at his weakness. He at his, his weakness. But still, there's something about him. Look at Enoch. His relationship with God was on another level. He was on an egg. He was, oh my God. Would, would you think, would you believe that there could be another Elijah? Or another Enoch? That will be translated? Or that God will just take them? Because there's so much value. His relationship. His connection with them. That death who act or serve as an interference and a breakage to the continuity of their relationship. Well, God bless you. You have a good time. Bye-bye.